Welcome to Slight Reliability, the show where we learn SRE and observability one week at a time. I'm Stephen Townsend. Welcome back to Slight Reliability. I'm Stephen Townsend, and this is the show where we learn SRE and observability one week at a time. Today, I am here with Courtney Nash, who is the uh, Internet Incident Librarian who works at Verica. Uh, how are you? How are you, Courtney? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for coming on. I was just curious, uh, what, what is Verica, first of all? Because I actually don't know yeah. what Verica do. Yeah, absolutely. Verica does a couple different things. Mostly, the I would say the overarching goal of Verica is to help people deal with complex software systems. Which you know you can't you can't just design a test suite for everything anymore, uh, as we know, right? So we have two main things that that we do. One is sort of an extension of the chaos engineering field. If people are familiar with that work, um, K- KCR founder had sort of developed the chaos engineering, not sort of did develop the chaos engineering program at Netflix, wrote the book on that. So we have what's called a continuous verification product that sort of helps you grapple with uh, complex system interactions and, and how they evolve over time. And then we have a, a security product also called Prowler, an open source version and Prowler Pro, which crawls uh, things like AWS and I think soon to come, actually might already have Google out on that. Um, and so sort of like dealing with the notion that those systems and those environments change so constantly. Uh, and so we give you sort of these continuous tools to kind of keep check on how things are going and find out where things might be going. Um, in unexpected directions. So that's that's, cool. that's what Eric is about. Yeah. Cool. And and, and what about your role? What what is uh I know your you I know incident incident librarian isn't like your official title, but what what so what do you no. do? What does your day to day look like? <laughs> So technically, I'm a researcher. I I have a very weird and diverse background. I I did go to college and graduate school for cognitive neuroscience. Uh, so I, I was particularly interested in sort of how people learn and remember. And uh, but then I ran off and joined the internet somewhere in the mid to late nineties. <laughs> And, uh, the internet. I love that. Yeah, well, I, you know, I was just watching what was happening. I went, I worked at Amazon in the early days, and then as one in Seattle does, I worked at Microsoft and a few other places like that. Uh, before I landed at O'Reilly Media, which was sort of what sent me down, really sent me down the road that I'm on, or the you know the the journey that I'm on now. I, I got involved in the early DevOps movement. I was a, a chair of the Velocity Conference uh, with John Allspa. And a few other folks along the way, and and I got really interested in how the complexity of our systems were evolving. But but given my background, particularly like the role that humans play in those systems, right? And so that's always been the thread that I've been pulling on is is instead of just looking at how does Kubernetes fail, right? For example, which is how I got started at Verica. I was doing product research. We have a couple of things we we specialize in are Kubernetes and Kafka because you know they're really simple. And never give people any problems whatsoever. Uh, right. So I was researching those and trying to, you know, help us understand more about what we could do for the product. And, and one of the things that I started doing was collecting incident reports for those. So Dan Liu has a GitHub repo called Kubernetes.af. I don't know if people are familiar with that. That was kind of one of the early things that I looked at. And uh, Lex Neva's sort of big archive of incidents, if you will, over time from the um, SRE Weekly newsletter that he's been running for quite some time now. And so while I was tr- trying to look at what was happening with with Kubernetes and Kafka, all of a sudden I looked around and I had like 2,000 of these incident reports that people had published. And I and people were really more interested in that <laughs> than, than other things, I think. So it sort of, it turned into this, the void, which is the Verica Open Incident Database. And I just collect incident reports that other people write. So I don't go off and you know, do the analysis or any of that. I, I mean, I have other analysis I do. You might call it like meta analysis, which we can we can talk about. But anytime anybody writes about something that happens and publishes it, uh, not anytime. We're still working on getting them all. I have it. I have a what I think is the tip of the iceberg. We have about ten thousand incident reports in there now. So so that's I do research across that corpus for the most part now at this point and trying to help us as an industry see things differently, sort of think about the notion of resilience and reliability and complexity uh, in differently, and in particular, spend more time and energy thinking about the roles that humans play in those systems. 
So that's, that, I would say that's the general focus of, of what I do. Oh, yeah, I would say, I mean, I, I, I'm just guessing that uh, it, when incidents occur, it's one of those moments when uh, it pushes, you know, individual and ten, sort of team behavior um, sort of really comes into play because, you know, there's a lot of pressure and you can't necessarily sort of plan out carefully exactly how you're going to react to a situation. And there's a lot of elements of being prepared and sort of creating muscle memory. I don't know. There's probably a whole bunch of stuff. I'm... Yeah. Well, I mean, what's really cool is that folks like John Alspa and myself and other people are pulling from and bringing in and connecting the dots between the software industry and other research areas like cognitive science and uh, cognitive systems engineering, human factors. Like there's all of these other folks out there who do study this stuff. They study how humans do in high pressure situations, in complex systems and environments, um, you know, high tempo, high consequence kinds of things. A, a lot of folks doing research in this space have come out of looking at things like Three Mile Island and <clears throat> nuclear reactors and airplane cockpits and and those kinds of things and they're they're pretty smart it turns out uh, and it we have a there's a lot of overlap in, in there that we can that we can learn from which is I think is really great and and I think we have a lot of myths in our industry that I'm hoping to help dispel some of at least I mean some might be closer to truth than others I guess you could say. <laughs> Speaking of myths, uh, one of the, you know, in the last couple of years, it might have even been you who spoke about this first about ESRECON. Uh, was it the, around MTTR and how it's just not yep. a useful, yeah, that, yeah. that, that, that talk was uh, quite impactful and I kind of heard it from every different place. Have you heard that MTTR means nothing anymore? It's not, don't use it. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a funny one because it's so um so yeah, meantime to resolve. It's this notion it's 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 sort of it's a house of cards in a really interesting way that makes so much sense, right? When you sort of look at it, you think, "Well, if you could say how long our incidents are and you could say on average how long it takes us, then if that average is getting bigger or smaller, then maybe we're doing better or worse at something." Um but when you kind of start to tease it apart and you look at at some of the foundational pieces of that, um, that's, that's really what I was able to do with some of the data from, from the void. So for example, for more than half of the incidents now, probably I haven't actually gone back to see what the percentage is, but it's probably teetering towards 75 or 80. Now, uh, the incidents in there have some form of duration data, metadata, right? So either, uh, we have a lot more status pages in there now. So those tend to come with metadata around when the team set the sort of start and end of those. But that's fuzzy, right? Like, so just starting with the notion of what the duration of an incident is, is very fuzzy on the front end and on the back end, and also sort of subjective and based on who decided that day, kind of, right? Um, also sometimes gets, you know, updated or changed over time. Like, so it's, it's a very, the foundation of, of that is tricky. And then if you go and look at the distribution of those data, which is sort of like a, you know, it's a data science 101 kind of thing, or if you want to go back as old as I am, a stats 101 thing. Um, but right, so you want to look at the distribution of those data, which means you need to make a histogram out of it, right? So you need to take all the incidents that are, and there again, here, this is arbitrary, we'll pick under an hour, under two hours, under three hours, whatever. And you look at that chart over time. And I'm assuming that most folks sort of SRE-ish or, or whatnot are at least familiar with histograms. And, and what's, what I was really taken by and which continues to be a very consistent pattern across incident data is they're not normally distributed, right? So they're not this like normal bell curve that we're all sort of used to seeing. Lots of things in the world are, are, are have this sort of normal distribution. You can take the mean of them and standard deviations and do all kinds of, you know, really cool statistical stuff with that. But it's different when you have what's these are called skewed data. So you have a big glut of all of your incidents up to the up to the left, and then it, you know big long sort of tail out to the right. So the good news of that is most of our incidents are actually pretty short. Like, and I think people don't always have that as the takeaway from that. But I'm like, oh, you know, like actually, you know, you're not bad at what you're doing here, folks. Like, the more than fifty percent of the time, things are, you fix things within an hour or two. And so I've always felt like that was the good takeaway. It, if you can just say like, uh, okay, duration's a little tricky, but let's just, let's go with the fact that it's fuzzy, but consistently that seems to be the pattern. The problem with that distribution is it means you can't actually take the mean of it. You can't take the average of it. 
right? That's the that's the very nature of a skewed distribution. And and um, we did some machinations and some fancy Monte Carlo simulations and stuff on top of that to try to really hammer that point home. But it it really is so noisy. Those data and that skew is as it were in the technical term for those data means that the mean not only is it like not helpful, like it can lie to you. Mm. <laughs> that's the word. And in either direction, right? Like, because if you average across something that's so skewed, sometimes you're going to get something that seems way better. And sometimes you're going to get something that seems like way worse. But it's a, it's such a like compelling <laughs> metric. Like people will fight me over this one. They're like, no, come on, there's got to be. And I'm like, it's hard. It's like a, there's no spoon kind of moment. You have to sort of accept how uncomfortable that is to just like let go of that seeming like a reasonable thing yeah well i i completely believe you <laughs> and, and, and resonates with me um from the performance engineering world i used to do where i used to spend a lot of time analyzing um time timing data so you might have you know million, yes. a million points of data and you know a lot of performance engineers even today will just just plot a line average across them which I think is so dangerous because you just get a situation where, you know, maybe 99% of, of your responses are like very, very quick. And that 1% is just, you know, taking 10 minutes and it just makes the yeah. average look at like, a completely meaningless number that doesn't tell you anything. Yeah. yeah. And then how, like, what are you doing then? Are you making, like, because this is where I always ask people, like, are you making a decision based on that? And if so, then you're making really bad decisions. And and engineers don't want to make bad decisions, right? You want to make good, well-informed decisions. So mm. I think that's that's what's interesting about that one um, as well. And uh, but but when you get layers away from performance engineers or people who are perhaps even like more comfortable looking at that, you know, that's that's where it gets tricky. Is uh, you know at the blunt end, as we say, further up the management chain, like. You can't see the world in that granularity. You have to have layers and levels of abstraction and ways to try to understand what's happening. You know, if you're a, you know, a VP of engineering or whatever. And so I think that's where the challenge is: is trying to figure out different ways to capture what's happening in those situations. Ye in those yes, um, yeah. So that's something I wanted to ask you about. So I listened to your interview you did on Arrested DevOps. Uh, and Arrested DevOps, yeah. That's the one. Yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, you were talking about. Yes. So you've got these sort of executive level, maybe sort of VP level uh, people and they, they'll have some like target set and they'll get a bonus yeah. if they meet a certain MTTR. I'm not saying everyone's that way, but I, I am saying, and like, and I mean, people, you know, like the second you make a metric a target, then people are going to, you know, pervert that, right? Or, or mm. uh, you know, like they're going to hit that, they're going to try to hit that target and not necessarily always by the most useful ways. And the reason I like people ask me this, why are you, why are you on such this tear about MTTR? And the reason is because for me, I look at it and it feels like a form of torture for the people who have to, to maintain these systems, right. Who operate and run these systems. Like they know the reality is that it's messy and, uh, and, and that there's, there's other things that they could be spending their time and their energy on or ways to like to think about making those systems better. And they know that, that, that this isn't you, but like oftentimes it's someone's job, right. To like Alec, you know, to average all this stuff up and send it up. And, and, and so I, I care about the people at the sharp end. I want them, <laughs> I want their voices to be heard better. And I want their work to, to be seen in a mm -hmm. different way, I think is really the most you know important part of that. Uh, because like the, the, the flip side too, of, of, of the incident situation is, it's very much human nature to focus on the incident, the thing going bad, the thing going wrong. But the vast majority of the time, those people and their actions and their expertise make those systems work. But we don't seem to talk about that as much, right? <laughs> and and, yeah. and the, the craziest thing I think about these kinds of systems is the things that you do one day to keep it running, that exact same thing another day might be what takes it down yeah. and so there's this this sophistication of understanding these kinds of systems that i think we're very far away from still right we still want to see things in very sort of um black and white terms and not and not we're not really investing in looking at how humans work in complex systems in software like i mentioned mm. people have done it elsewhere but like we we are the reason you all everyone are the reason these work the vast majority of the time 
what's that? About? Like, why are we not somehow? I mean, I'm not saying go measure that. Like, please don't actually try to measure that. Like, don't. Yeah, because it gets um, weaponized in all kinds of horrible yeah, ways. Yeah, it gets there. weaponized in really horrible ways, right? Because then you're looking at like engineer performance, and that's not what I'm talking about. Um, you know, I'm not talking about developer throughput or any of that kind of stuff. Um, mm. So uh, I'm ranting now, aren't I? <laughs> No, no, it's good. I mean, you got me thinking about something isn't on the notes as well, which is uh, the book, I guess the book Sooner Save You Happier talks about this concept of the digital age and uh, we've moved mm -hmm. into this world of unknown unknowns. And so that we basically, there's just everything that happens every day pretty much is impossible to, to, to sort of predict. And there's just yeah. so much complexity and it's, everything's so interconnected. It's just, this is the world that we live in now and having to sort of reframe our minds in the way that we work to sort of say, this is just how it is. We can't yeah. just go in and say, you know, have a, a fixed view or process anymore. Yeah. Is it, do you think yeah, that's, that's I mean, true? Or? I, yeah, I mean, I do. I think, you know, again, the there's people who've long studied, you know, sort of human performance and attention. And they're, you know, they're, to some degree, there's some science, you know, there's science around that. But, but what is... What, and I, I did that kind of science, right? For a long time, it was like this black box of what's in your head. Um, but what I think is really fascinating is to look at, yeah, how how do we grapple with complexity in a in a more the term that that researchers use is joint cognitive system. It's very sort of fancy, academic-y sounding thing, right? But it's humans and computers, and I think a lot of this comes to like a lot of it is our our sort of ingrained beliefs about what machines are for and and what humans are for right and i think we i think we all for a large part have this belief that like we have machines to do things that we can't do or that we're not as good at right um and so you give all the like automatable stuff to the computers um and then we'll do this other stuff like this notion of sort of separation of duties and control and that's not the reality that's not how it works that's not how we do our jobs that's not how these systems work either right and so I think I think part of that is we think about complexity in an us versus it sort of way, mm -hmm. um, but we are part of that <laughs> complexity, right? And and we we generate it, we deal with it, we manage it jointly with these things, with these machines, and with this increasing amount of automation that we're building. And when that automation fails, right? Like what? we don't even know what's happening anymore in there. And so like, there's a lot, and, like, and, and I, that's one of the things I'm really getting very interested in is, is this notion of, um, of cognitive systems engineering and joint cognitive systems. Like how do we design these systems? And, and that's not novel in a way, right? And especially like if you're a UX designer or, you know, you're, you're somebody who designs interfaces or those things for, for customers or whatever, you spend a lot of time looking at this stuff. And I think what we don't do, especially in, in like the SRE world and the engineering world, like tools for operators, tools for maintainers, tools for developers, they're not, they're not good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I work at a, at a like a, 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 you know, like a place for that, right? Like, I mean, we care about that too, but it's, it, I don't think that we think about that world very much. And yet here we are, we're the ones behind you know, the scenes making that all work. And so, yeah, when I think about dealing with complexity, I think part of it is these, again, another myth, right? That we have computers to do things that we're not good at and they'll just go off and do that and we'll be over here doing this stuff. That's one that I would love to see us start thinking really differently about as an industry. Yeah, I, yeah, you've just like dropped this like piece of the puzzle in my brain, um, and that's awesome. Basically, I've come to the conclusion that as SREs, like technology and improving it is like part of the work that we do. But there's, there's even more of the work is about improving people and process and structure and ways of working. Uh, and so yeah. I, I've been thinking a lot about how we sort of, how, you know, but we we make technology systems observable and to understand how they're going and what's happening. We don't really do that with these other systems, um, which are no. maybe more difficult difficult to, to monitor, yeah. monitor and measure. But now, well, like, but now, I, the, what, yeah, sorry, you go. So I'll give you two things to think about on that front. There are two pieces of, of sort of research. One is much older and one is much newer. So the older one, I don't know if you've heard of this paper. It's the same Bainbridge. It's called Ironies of Automation. Go read that and then get back to me. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, it was written in 83. Um, and it's wow. she's so spot on about so much of what we are now grappling with. And then the other one is Laura McGuire. Uh, it was her PhD dissertation a couple years back. She was working at Jelly for, for quite a few years. 
and it's on um, the cost of coordination in incidents. And her research was really looking at what humans have to do during incidents, right? And like, what is the cognitive load of say an incident commander versus somebody who's trying to, you know, and like really like, what does that cost of coordination look like during an incident, which is like a high tempo, high consequence thing, but it, it's a, it's a different, it's a lens into just what you're talking about, right? Like how do systems of people work together and, uh, and ways to make that work better. And so her, her lens is particularly through incidents, but I think that you'd find it really fascinating because it is research looking at, and even giving you ways to sort of start measuring potentially what that looks like. Right. Like, so what is that cost for coordination on your organization? How can you deal with things either perhaps differently to reduce that cost of coordination to make, you know, sort of incident response better. But I think that could be generalized uh, in, in really fascinating ways. So let's say you are a leader <laughs> or maybe a team and you, you want to take stock of like, you know, where you are in terms of, of, pro, of managing incidents and get, to get better yeah. at it. Like, so MTTR, yeah. right. Obviously we, we, we've taken that and we've thrown it in the garbage because it's not right. going to help us necessarily. What, what can you look at to get a sense of how maybe, you know, not necessarily how fast if there isn't, if it's not the right way to look at it, but how do how do you get a sense of where you're at? So you yeah. Can yeah. So, I mean, I'm part of this, this community that was started by Nora Jones, who's the CEO of Jelly and a few other folks called the Learning from Incidents Community, LFI, and very much in some ways similar to communities have grown out of other complex, high consequence systems, airlines, you know, aviation, nuclear power, like there are other groups of people who have got get together and share this stuff. And I, I think that the biggest thing I've learned from that community and that I, I try to tell people is all spa, John all refers to incidents as unplanned investments, <laughs> all right? <laughs> you just unexpectedly spend a bunch of money on something. So the best thing you can do is learn from that. And the way you find out if you're, if you're learning if from an organization is to ask the people involved, <laughs> right? So you have to talk to, you, you know, your incident responders, uh, you know, what we're seeing is a trend of companies hiring incident analysts, either external or building that out as a capacity internally. And these are people who have a different skill set than, you know, so, so talking to people after an incident is not like you have firefighters and then you have like accident investigators, right? And like, they have some degree of domain knowledge. If you come in and you investigate the accidents or the train accidents or whatever, but you're not the one fighting the fire or mm. piloting, right? So the, the folks who come in and help analyze these have a very different set of skills and uh, they're honestly kind of journalistic, right? Anthropo and anthropological, right? They can go and they can talk to people. They can get their experiences, their, their shared stories, like the impact that they had on them. And then they can tell these narratives and they can surface these stories in hopefully a way that is compelling to the organization. And what leaders can do is look at whether that information is getting used, is getting shared, right? Like, and my favorite version of my favorite story of this, people are like, that sounds really complicated and, and, uh, and it is, but there's people who are really good at it. Like I said, but, um, at IBM, there's a fellow who's also in the, the learning from incidents community named David Lee and another fellow named Randy Horowitz. They gave a talk at the LFI conf, which you can go look up. There's a YouTube channel, L, L as in Larry, F as in Frank, I as in Irene, LFI conf. <laughs> um, all the videos from that are there. I gave a talk there too. But uh, David and Randy go into the work they've done in the office of the CIO at IBM, which is like a 12,000 person organization. You know, we're not talking about like, Wow. Small beans here. Uh, and the work that they've invested in shaping how they respond in, to incidents, but really how they analyze them after the fact, how they capture that information, how they share that information. And they've built up this monthly review meeting and they're tracking who watches the videos, how many executives are coming, like what the sort of traction of those is. And they've seen this grow oh, since I think they started this in early 2022. They're now getting hundreds of people and, and even at the executive, you know, sort of level from the office of the CIO invested in this process of learning from their incidents. And they're not demanding, you know, these other kinds of metrics. They're seeing that the value of that. And then what happens is out of those, they have 
demonstrable like projects or investments that they make because of what they've learned from those incidents. I have a slide I can send you or I can point you to his talk. You can really go see it. And it shows like, oh, we did this infrastructure project and the, the execs signed off on this because they saw the value of like, so it's it's not a number that you can target, right? It's a, right. It's a process of pushing learning out into your organization. But here's the thing. Ask those executives, do you have a, a learning and, and education budget, right? Do you? Do you have a training and education budget? Like, do you? Because if, if so, then they get it. They get the notion that you can, you know, that you can, it, you can spend money on, on that, right? On education in that sense. But then you can think about it from a different angle. Mm. Um, so I think that... That's the catch is if you could ask, you know, from an executive level, incidents are unplanned investments. How do we get a return on that investment? Well, we have to figure out what we can learn from that. Okay. So it sounds like if you're, if you're an executive or like a CIO and you, you just want to be kind of disconnected from everything and just be told how well things are going, that's not really a, a, a great model. It's better to say, we can't give you a metric, but we can sort of surface what's happening with incidents and how we're dealing with them and what we're learning from them and where, where the sort of patterns and pain points are, you know, but you have to be involved in that process. Otherwise it's just not going to go anywhere. Is that yeah. Kind of yeah. And I love that you said patterns because I think the folks that are doing really stellar work in this space are looking for themes is a, is a word that people commonly use or patterns. Um, and so are you starting, like, are you seeing themes or patterns across your incidents? And then can you, uh, you know, can you extract that out and go, well, this pattern seems like X. And then, you know, what comes out of that? Some kind of, you know, architectural thing or some kind of, you know, infrastructural investment thing. But instead of like the engineers just going, we know we need this. Now you have a, a form of data, right? Patterns and themes are data. They're just a different kind of data, right? They're qualitative mm. data rolled up into a more quantitative form. And this is mm. what, and this is what other kinds of social scientists do. Right? They collect qualitative human data and then they roll it up into ways that are a little more understandable. It's not a target metric like MTTR, but it can tell you like, oh, here are the themes we're hearing from talking to your people over and over again. And it's sort of like if you walk the floor, you figure out where your unsafe spaces are, right? Like you, you have to go and talk to the people and then they'll keep telling you, oh, this is what's happening. This is what's happening. And then from that, you can generate data, if you will, to that then inform what you should do to improve that. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. I love the themes and patterns though. I think that really is, if you can invest in people who know how to pull out themes and patterns, you will figure out what's happening in your systems better. Yeah. This is like a really like tiny microscopic example of that. But we, uh, we had this yeah. thing where we would go into teams that are my previous role in, and we would benchmark their reliability because they had, they had no idea. It's just a general mm -hmm. thing. And so we'd go in yeah. and benchmark it. And one of the things we looked at was how many incidents they were having, what how severe they were, and look for patterns. And we worked mm -hmm. with this one team, and it re they were dealing with like two or three like minor incidents every single day. And each one would take oh. about two hours of investigation. And they, they just they just went through them and dealt with them. And it... We did the analysis and it turned out that like ninety nine percent of those were just call center staff raising some minor technical incident tickets for for just a, a proper business rule, just firing. But just because the mm -hmm. UI was so bad, the customers thought it was a technical incident. And it's just like you know, but, but like, like they were seeing this. But, every and they were day, just they fighting needed, these fires over and over and exactly. over every single day. They just needed an external yeah. person to come and say that's not right. <laughs> you know, yeah. we could give a quick fix to that. You know, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a I mean, that's a great example. I think. I'm guessing that in your world that major sort of higher priority incidents is sort of the world that you live in, or is, it, is there also value in looking at minor sort of I incidents? think there's value looking at near misses. Mm. So, uh, and this also comes from research in other high consequence, high tempo domains. Aviation has invested a huge amount in near misses because near misses tell you a couple of different, they give you a, a, quite a few interesting things. So they give you a situation where the bad thing didn't really happen. First of, all, first of all, right? So you're talking earlier about like, oh, when you have incidents, there's, it's sort of, it is, right? Even, even if they're not massive or major, inc incidents are stressful, right? Like something's wrong. We must fix it. We are people, and we all show up at our jobs every day, not to cause incidents, not to screw up, right? Like we show up every day to do good work. Like that's what we do, right? Mm -hmm. So, so near misses don't have any of that sort of um, emotional or psychological strain. They're also pockets of, adaptive capacity, right? To use another nerdy 
research term, but where you typically, I will also add you, the humans, someone in the system was like, Hey Jane, did you see what, what's going on over here? And then like, Oh, Oh, that's it. And then you fix it and it never, no one ever knows. Like it doesn't go out into the world. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you dig into number two, a bit, you find out then upstream kinds of reasons why that might be happening, right? So it, it's all a lot of the same information you could get from an incident, but it's almost like it's from a success, right? It's something that, I mean, I don't want to say like you were a hero, you saved the day. I'm not really a big fan of that kind of, of cultural, you know, yeah. referencing of our work, but, but it is a success. And so then you have these opportunities to study, why was that a success? Like what, mm -hmm. what are humans doing? to make these things work, but where, what were the stressors or the, the pressures of your environment or whatever that, that led to that. And then you can like pull those threads back and go, Oh, well, it's because someone was filing these tickets, you know, like almost like those, you know, right. Those almost sounded like near misses. Uh, and mm -hmm. then there's, I, I just, there's so much rich information in there without as much of the environment for like blame or shame, especially if you're in a not so great culture, right? Where incidents are really awful. You, mm. you have this, this less strained environment in which to investigate something. So I'm really a big fan of near misses more than even like a whatever, however someone might categorize the, the scale or size or severity of an of a actual incident. I love it a lot. Uh, yeah, and, and I got me thinking about uh, you, you read the Phoenix Project? Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, the, the character Brent. There's always this person who knows oh, everything. And like, <laughs> like and it, the incident didn't happen, but only because Brent was here. If Brent wasn't here, we well, would have been stuck. <laughs> a lot of, that is honestly, well, I think, pro I, I don't know because nobody publishes near misses, right? <laughs> Hardly. A few, <laughs> a, few, a few folks do. Honeycomb and a couple other companies sometimes tell you about their near misses. Um, they often show up as like conference talks, right? So they're not like a big corpus of, of data that I have. But I do think the the pockets of expertise is a near miss pattern that is you can mm. definitely find. Like you'll find it in incidents too, but it's harder to find, I think, in incidents because once something sort of reaches incident level, especially with the complexity of our systems, then next thing you know, you might have Brent, but you probably have seven other people. And so it's harder to like realize Brent's Brent. But I think in near misses a lot of time it is because Brent or Jane, or whoever that one, you know, and, and like, there's a really great example of that from a near miss that Honeycomb talked about on our podcast, where they had like one Kafka expert. And then Liz Fong Jones came in and kind of learned some of that, but not really. And then the Kafka expert left. And guess what? <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere in here is a Twitter reference, I'm sure. But uh, <laughs> right, like, it's, so that's, you know, there's, there's the pockets of expertise. And then there's the fact that people leave with that, you know, when they leave, they leave with that expertise, which is also a very common pattern, right, in our mm -hmm. industry. So I think those are even easier to find in near misses, because often that's one or two, that's the person who knows that system that well is the one who caught it. Mm. And that's an anti pattern, right? Right. I mean, yeah. Brent's an anti-pattern. We don't want Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> that. When, so, when you get yeah. a person with that much knowledge, they should be spending them, you know, they should be focusing all their effort into getting that their, out of their brain into, uh, into other systems yeah. and people. Right. And, but it's yeah. hard, like, right. Like we talk a lot in, in, especially in sort of these fields of research about production pressures, yeah. other kinds of pressures, right? Like you're not uh, as a company, you're not incentivized often. And as a team, you're not incentivized to, to get that information out of people's heads. And it's hard yeah. when it's changing. And when it changes so, right, uh, so much change is inevitable and so constant in our world. These are all very hard things to grapple with. Okay. So yeah, another sort of, well, I think it's common, but then maybe this because of like what I read and everything is the common sort of idea is that uh, talking about the root cause of an incident is uh, it's not, yes. It's not helpful. So can you just sort of elaborate on that? Yeah. Well, I mean, this is another understandable human instinct, right? Um, and you, you mentioned earlier, like the complexity of the world that we live in, it's daunting. It's at times exhausting and terrifying, right? Mm. And, and lo love it or not, we live in sort of this Arist Aristotelian world, right? Of cause and effect. And, and that is so pervasive, in our minds and our culture that, that, that we can, that something happens and we can go back and attribute a cause to it. Right. But that's not how complex systems work. Uh, that's not how the world really works. And so, yeah, you see it a lot. You still see it in, in quite a few, um, incident, you know, reports. It's really 
it's pretty, I thought it was pervasive in the industry, but I think it's not entirely. I think there's quite a few large organizations that have done that. Google has been one. Microsoft actually shifted their language in the last year or so. They don't use RCA anymore, root cause analysis. They do post-incident reviews. And I think that's important because the language that we use does shape the way we think about these things, right? Like if I just came to you and your group and I said, hey, we're going to go we're going to look at this incident. We're going to talk about all the factors that could have, you know, contributed to it and, you know, sort of talk to everyone about their experiences of what happened and kind of paint a picture of this, right? Versus if I came into that environment, I said, okay, we're going to figure out what went wrong and we're going to fix it. You know, those are two very different ways of thinking about it. And they guide the way that you then go and do that investigation and that and that analysis. So that's mm -hmm. one thing. I think that it limits, I mean, and people are like, oh no, I could call it whatever and I could still think differently. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm a psychologist and I disagree. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's part of it, right? Is the language. But I think I think the thing that's most important is that when you can embrace the notion that complex systems fail because that day at that moment these two components interacted in a way that you couldn't have foreseen. And then because the system's so complex, it fell down in this very surprising way. If you can embrace that, then you, you know, you can also embrace the notion that humans don't cause these things, mm. but that's a very pervasive outcome of a lot of root cause kinds of analysis. Cause like in a complex system where there is no root cause, when you have to come up with one, what are you going to come up with? The person who fat fingered the config file or right. The person who didn't catch that thing, like it, it, because you can't actually do it, but you have to, right. If you're, if your process or your system or your expectations are that there will be a root cause identified, then you either stop short, right. You say, okay, yeah. it was this config file, bad config file. And you don't go like, why? Do we, why, you know, like you don't go <laughs> upstream of that or you go person pushed that config file and right. Mm. So that, that, that need for that kind of certainty of a single cause, it defines where you're going to stop looking at some point. Yeah. I've, I've seen pathological cultures before where it would be almost uh, to do with the, the root cause would be whichever team has the least politically savvy manager who can sort of speak. And <laughs> Yes. 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 So if you if you if you are in sort of a, a generative healthy culture and you still do root cause, you might be doing great, right? And I don't I know what I don't do is pick on people who use that language, right? Like I don't I'm not like you're doing it wrong. Like I get it. I get why we as humans want this, right? Like I want that certainty and I hate it when I don't get it. It's mm. very uncomfortable. But in a pathological culture, root cause is oh, it's dangerous. I, I I believe that word honestly. It's dangerous to people in that in that kind of a culture, um, and it, it just it just leads to such unhealthy and and bad outcomes. So so I think it's 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 the complexity of those things, right? But it's like the language we use shapes the way we view these problems, and it shapes the way we investigate them. And if you really want to understand, then even that shift. And I think it's I think it's telling that a, a, an organization as large as like the Microsoft Azure team decided to do this. They, they mm -hmm. saw the value in even just shifting the language. But then when you go and look at the kinds of incident reports, when they concurrently, when they made that shift, they have all this more rich detail. And then like, they're looking at all of these other things and explaining this, the way they're explaining their incidents, even publicly is, is demonstrably different too. Mm -hmm. So I believe, and I believe in a very Gene Kim Phoenix project, Nicole <laughs> Forsgren, except accelerate sort of way that, there is some competitive advantage to embracing the fact that that is the nature of your systems and committing to learning from them in that way. I do believe that organizations that do that will have some form of a competitive advantage. I just don't have the data to prove it yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, one more thing on the sort of uh, okay. the words we use, blameless yeah. post-mortem. What do you think of using post-mortem? <laughs> is that a bad thing? You know, we, we, we borrow terms from other industries. I also think that is a very human thing. I think, you know, metaphors are great shortcuts and all of that. Do I like postmortem? Not so much. Um, our systems, it's not dead. In fact, it's not even bad. It's just doing what it was designed to do. And you just don't even know all of what you just learned more. Right. So I definitely love the sort of 
I think Microsoft's, you know, post incident review is fine. Yeah. I think learning review is great. Retrospective is also, you know, if we're going to nitpick language, I like all of those. If you use blame as postmortem, go like I'm fine. <laughs> I, I don't care. I'm not here to tell you what you should or shouldn't say really, you know, anyways, but, um, I do think it was a very important step in choosing that language at the time to try to, at the very least, introduce the notion of, well, what does blamelessness mean and why is that important? So I think that it's a it's an interesting uh, counterbalance of words, right? It's blameless <laughs> yeah. of a dead thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. you know, blameless retrospective. I mean, you know, again, I do, I, I choose words, try to choose words carefully and I believe they have meaning, but I also think that I can see the intent there that I think is really important. Do the work is really what I can like go, go invest in figuring out what's happening. Listen to your people, listen to them, tell you the true tales of what's happening with the systems and invest in learning from that. That's, you know, call and then call that whatever you want. Thank you so much, Courtney, for, for coming on the show and sharing your, your knowledge and expertise. It's, um, I think we're going to get a lot out of this and, uh, yeah, so thanks for taking your time. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. I love podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. All right. Thanks once again, everyone, for tuning in, and I'll uh, see you all next time.